So Santo, thank you so much for making time to share your insights into the future of leadership. Thank you so much, Dr. Nick. Uh, lovely to be here. Thank you. It's great to have you on the show. And Santo, before we walk into the future, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Where did you grow up? <laughs> Thank you so much. You know, it's very interesting that uh, I'm actually a coastal girl. I grew up in Durban mm -hmm. uh, and I grew up in the township um, called uh, Nduzuma, just outside Guamash. Mm -hmm. That's where I spent a lot of my time. I went to schools there. Um, so that's really where I grew up, um, I, up until I finished um, matric um, in, in, in KZN. Uh, and when I finished... Um, I then studied also at the University of Natal in Durban. So I did a lot of um, my earlier life, uh, early into uh, my career um, from Durban. Immediately when I finished the university, I worked at Unilever, which was also headquartered in, uh, in Durban. Mm -hmm. So I am a Durban person through and through. I only moved to Johannesburg very late uh, in my life. All right. And Santo, can you tell us what was your dream career when you grew up? Sure. You know, Dr. Nick, you know, growing up the way that uh, I grew up, um, we we always uh, dreamt of nothing bigger than just a better uh, situation than where we were. So I grew up in a very, uh, in a poor environment, very humble beginnings. Um, all I just wanted to do and what I, I what, what I dreamt of was just getting out of poverty. So all I wanted to do was just get out of that situation, which even at an early age, I knew there was something wrong with the life that I was living and the life that my family was living. It was just not OK. Of course, I wasn't aware uh, in my earlier uh, years uh, of apartheid and what was really going on in South Africa. But somewhere, somehow, I knew it was just not right. And, and my mother always said to me, all you must try and do is just to get an education, and then you can change your life. So it was less about a career. It was about, I need to get out of this situation. There has to be something better than this. Right. And Santo, can you tell us, who inspired you or maybe what inspired you in your early days? Um, you know, in my earlier days, the my frame of reference was really uh, my mother. Yeah. Because um, in a situation where this the, the, the life that we were living was very tough, but just seeing her as a single uh, woman just living and giving us a life despite all odds that really inspired me to be able to say you know there's nothing that can be difficult in life she is pulling through taking me to uni to, to university taking me to school taking us as a, as, the, as the kids you know after they divorced with my father um but with nothing she had nothing and she created something out of nothing. And I always looked at that life and I got inspired to say, and later on, we, we heard it from Mandela to say to for him to say to us, nothing is impossible. It's 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 impossible until it is done. Because it was coming from that situation of we are poor, we have nothing, but yet I am in a university with very well off kids that when I look at them and I look at my life, I'm like, how, how is this even possible? Um, so that really inspired me to say, how do you take your difficult situation and build something out of it? And how do you build resilience out of, out of nothing? I mean, she had no resources, she had nothing, but we lived, we're happy, went to school. And today I, I'm here where I am because of what she did and what she taught me and how she she made me to be a strong person um, as early as, as, as when I was, what, 14 years when my parents divorced and I learned to be self-sufficient at that point. 
Now, Sonto, um, you're leading a very impressive career in marketing and tourism. I believe you started your career at Unilever, then went, went on to, uh, to the KZN Tourism Authority, um, senior manager at Standard Bank, um, played a major role at Brand South Africa, and obviously now South African tourism. So looking back over your leadership career, would you say there was a turning point or maybe a number of turning points? Yeah, well, the first turning point was I was at Unilever for just over 10 years. Yeah. And when I was at Unilever um, in 1998, I was offered an opportunity to go and work in Kenya. You know, I was young, maybe I was, what, 22, 23, had never been outside the country. And here I was given an opportunity uh, to go and work in this uh, in this market that I know nothing about. And of course, from where we come from, um, everybody is nervous. There's a lot of anxiety. My mother would say, how would you go to Kenya? You don't know anybody there. So I went to Kenya because I, I was curious. But what I found is that just that experience, I spent three years in Kenya, that changed my outlook, that changed my life. I learned how to live with um, other people who didn't speak my language, <laughs> who didn't yeah. know me, but to build a new ecosystem and a support system and just coming in and lead a team that knows nothing about you. In, and for me, that was a turning point. In fact, I still mark my years in Kenya as, as my best years of my life because I grew phenomenally as a person. Right. Um, and, and that changed my outlook completely. Um, and I was doing that also, everybody that I told from home that I'm going to Kenya, they were they could not understand why would you go to Kenya? What's in Kenya? And it was amazing how everybody has got an opinion about a place that they've never been to. And, yeah. and they don't believe that I should go. But I just had this thing within me that pushed me to want to do it, to want to try something new, to want and go there and be independent and build a new uh perspective about life and about myself. So I think that would be the first uh, turning point. The second turning point was when I was offered the job in 2017 at uh, Limpopo Tourism as a CEO for Limpopo Tourism. Now, if you know South Africa, we've got nine provinces. Um, Limpopo is up in the north. A lot of people at the time believed that there was nothing there. And they said to me, why would you go to Limpopo? Now, South Africa, we battle with our own diversity issues as a country. We mm -hmm. have got um, 11 languages, now 12 with a sign, a sign language. We, we have our own very different and diverse uh, cultural um, heritage. So people in KZN, because of how South Africa, you know, developed, they don't see themselves as, as they could go and thrive in another province where they don't speak the language like a Limpopo because there's different languages being spoken there. But I took on that challenge once again because I'm just curious. And I said, no, one, I believe I can do it. Two, I believe I can add value, but I also am keen to just learn more from these people that are South Africans, they are my people, but I've just, as a human being, I haven't really spent time understanding the culture, the heritage, and understanding what's going on in Limpopo. So I went there with a the determination of, I can do this, I can make a change, and nothing is gonna stop me, I will just do it. And, and that for me, getting into a market where, you, I, once again, I didn't speak the languages, I didn't know anybody, just walked in there as a CEO. And and, and you would know that uh, Dr. Nick, Nick in, in leadership, when you lead, you need people to support you. You, you. Your success comes from, you know, people buying into your vision uh, and taking on that vision and running with it and really making it bigger than what's in your head. 
But I, I went through uh, into this market, not knowing how I'm going to be supported. But I just had this belief that it can't be difficult. All I need to do is to be myself, do the work, and show the people what I see about the province. And, and my years in Limpopo um, were, were really quite uh, phenomenal. You know, once again, I met phenomenal people, amazing people who didn't know me, but supported the cause that I was driving, supported me. And to this day, you know, they 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 really hold me in very high re regards and, and they still support me. I get calls from all over. I mean, I still mentor some people in Limpopo who have asked me to help them in growing their businesses, growing what they're doing, in just uh, changing some of the perspectives that they have. So, so that also sort of changed my life. And, 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 and Dr. Nick, what you need to understand is that the one other thing that happened in my career is I went from a classical marketing where I'm, I'm dealing with products you know, I was working on uh, Rama Margarine, Flora, Stock. I was working on household uh, brands, Kuno, uh, Omo. That's what I was working on. And I was trained to be a marketer of those things. But when I transitioned from marketing the products to marketing the country, that would be perhaps the ultimate um, uh, turning point. Because I had to make a personal decision, which was, why would you leave a Unilever? It's a great place to work. It's phenomenal. Why would you leave all of that comfort? But at the time, I, I felt I wanted to add value to the country. I wanted to give a little bit of my experience to my country. So I went into destination marketing more as a uh, patriotic kind of a move to say, mm -hmm. as a South African, what's my role in this country, in this country's development? What can I do? I've learned so much in my experience, but now what can I do um, to actually help the country move forward? And I suppose that would be the, the biggest and the most fundamental shift um, in my career. And also because it means you have to forego the, the commercial benefit because you know in, in private sector they pay you handsomely and go and move into government where it's, you are doing more of a of a civil service and you are serving uh, and that teaches you a lot so that for me is how i would summarize the various points of um, turning points of, of my career thank you so sonto is it fair to say that what's driving you today is really servant leadership absolutely you know um, because where we are, we have to ask ourselves questions. Um, if, if there are problems in the country and there are problems everywhere we go, I felt that I can sit somewhere out there in a fancy office and not participate in the solution and not be part of the solution. You know, now I will feel comfortable that wh whatever is going on in South Africa, I've I've contributed, I've been part of it, but also in doing so, I've also learned a lot about serving, about serving because it's really not about the position. It's about understanding serving your country. It's understanding where the country is at, where the communities are and how you bring them along. So absolutely um, servant, uh, servant leadership. Now, Sonto, looking into the future, um, can you tell us in a few words, what does the future of leadership mean to you? Sure. Um, at the center of the future leadership, um, for me, is the whole issue about sustainability and inclusivity. And, and why I say that is we, we are looking for leaders that are going to understand the, the impact of humanity on the environment. And because and that for me is, is quite important and, and drive that forward in the way that they lead. But second of all, it's about 
inclusivity. How do we bring everybody together? And how do we make sure that everybody is part of what, of what is going on? We cannot continue to promote a situation of some people becoming far better than others and leaving some other people behind. So it's very important that those two elements, they are, they are, they are brought in hand in hand to be part of where we're going. So if we're looking at, um, if I just draw it into tourism, uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Nick, for example, um, tourism right now, we are busy um, trying to drive the, the recovery of the sector coming out of COVID-19. But at the center of all of that, it's, it's not just tourism the way that we know it. It's about sustainable tourism because tourism relies heavily on our natural beauty. And if we don't instill in, in, in our kids who will become the future leaders at some point, the importance of the environment, we might wake up not having any tourism to enjoy. You know, and imagine if we don't look after uh, the Table Mountain, you know, there won't be any Table Mountain to look at or to visit in the future. So we, we've got to be very mindful, one, to say, as we are not the future leaders, but there are those coming after us, what are we deciding today? What are our decisions that are going to impact what they do? But how do we instill the values of sustainability in those that are going to be coming as future leaders to take um, you know, our country uh, forward. So that for me is very important. I think the other aspect is, is the one of saying that the future leaders must also be very, very brave. You know, if you look at uh, how we are living uh, today, um, there's there's a lot of criticisms everywhere that you go. Mm. So if we don't find people who are brave, who are going to take on the baton and say, whether I'm being criticized or not, I'm going to play my part and I'm going to do something. You will have people who want to sit in their corner and not want to lead. But because leadership is all about the courage, the courage to take on something that nobody else wants to take, um, the courage to stand up and be counted and want to influence um, you know, the outcome of, of where you are. But that won't happen if we don't have courageous young people who are daring, who are, who are courageous and brave and want to, to believe they can do something. The danger, Dr. Nick, which I see today is I'm just going to mind my own business. Mm. And the danger with those words is it means you mind your own business. You don't want to be part of it and you make it somebody else's problem. And then you will sit at the back and criticize whoever has put their hand up. So I would like to see the future leaders that we are developing already uh, coming out and being brave and stand for something. I always say, even to my kids, pick a side. It doesn't matter. You don't have to be right or wrong. Just pick a side, stand for something. And because if you stand for something, then you have something that you're driving forward. You cannot be in between and, and not being brave and pick a side. So, so I think for me, those are very, very important uh, uh, sort of attributes that we're looking for, for the young leaders who are going to really drive this future leadership that we want to see. Leadership that can improve the lives of the people um, in this country and, and make a difference in the world. Um, you know, I, I, I make a, an observation that um, mm -hmm. I suppose that, um, you know, when Nelson Mandela was young, he probably didn't know he was going to be a leader. But because he believed in something and he wanted to drive that agenda and he emerged as, as that leader. So people, are, the, the young ones, they need to learn to say, what do I stand for? What are the values that I'm going to fight for? And, and fight for that. But, but most importantly, the bravery to raise your hand, even when things are difficult. 
Now, Sonto, these are challenging times as the world is stumbling from one crisis into the next. What mm -hmm. is your advice for future leaders in terms of challenges? What are some of the big challenges they should expect to encounter in their career? Well, in the career, it's it's one, it's very competitive, you know, um, especially, you know, not even in government side, but, you know, in, in, in this private sector spaces, it becomes very competitive. And when it becomes competitive, it becomes about the survival of the fittest. And, and so people must always be wary of, of that, because if you get stuck in the competitiveness, then you miss the opportunity to make a difference um, because it becomes about me, me, you know, you protecting yourself. But if you step out of that and sort of say, but what, what am I trying to influence here? What's my bigger picture? What am I trying to do? Then you're most likely to actually succeed. So people, I think they must be wary of the competitiveness that happens, especially in, in an office environment that might lead them to make them the wrong, the wrong decisions. Second of all, I think also what is a challenge is um, where people chase money than purpose. Right. Um, um, because when you now are chasing the salary and not your purpose, then of course you're gonna miss the point. And then you're gonna end up doing the wrong things. And then the wrong things can't take us you know, forward. So I think that becomes quite important. Um, but I, I think the other thing, it's, it's this whole thing around um, you know, people dynamics. You know, mm -hmm. we, 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 we are here, we are because of other people. Mm -hmm. And when we hit the leadership positions, which um, you know, I, I always believe that we we must not necessarily be leading because of the positions where when we lead, we lead. And if you are a leader, you're a leader. But right. but what's important is that um if you are with the people, you need to understand what impact can you make in their lives? What positive, how can you touch them in such a way that you know, you 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 grow them, you make them be, feel they belong, you make them feel that they can make mistakes and they can be supported. Um, the, 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 the lovely thing about being um, in a leadership position is when you see other leaders that you create in your interaction um, on a daily basis. And, and sometimes you don't set out to say, today I'm gonna grow three people. But through your your being and and how you do what you do, you will find that later the things that you did, the things that you said, the help that you you were giving, has actually inspired another person to their greater heights. So so I I think that we mustn't forget about the fact that it's all about the people that we we lead, the people around us, and the and the impact that we make on them. And, and that for me becomes quite important. You actually can't lead if the people around you don't support you and don't want to follow, to use the words, but it's it's for them to, to buy into what you're trying to do, to want to support you in your vision and to for them to be your, 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 your support network that helps you to, to also um, set you to, to, to greater heights. So the people are very important. So I think that's, that becomes quite important. And, and, and I think that the, the one other thing that's important is how do we as leaders identify the people and, and, and help to grow that potential? Uh, you can be in your office space and just do what you do and not take notice of people who actually have the potential. And when you see the potential, it's almost like you see a seed and then you take that seed and what do you do with that seed? And you help to grow and you encourage and you water that to make sure that that, that person can grow into, into, um, 
into a bigger role, into becoming a leader, so that your legacy becomes how many other leaders have I been able to, to grow um, in the work that I do, whether directly or indirectly, whether in your office or outside your space. But the, the, the greater feeling for any leader, if you ask me, is when you see that there's other people that um, you've changed their lives, you've made them become leaders in their own spaces, and they've learned something uh, through your journey. Now, Santo, as a mentor to so many future leaders, can you maybe share a success story or two where you mentored an upcoming leader and that person took your advice to heart? Sure. Uh, that's quite interesting. So there's quite a few um, stories uh, of people that have, have helped uh, um, and, and helped to grow uh, what they do. Um, what happened to me when I was here at South African Tourism uh, the first time, 2008, um, I, I stumbled upon a person who came through an interview and, and I was in an environment that was called at the time business tourism. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a space that I'm very passionate about, which is about mice and the meetings and the incentives and the conferences and how we bring those um, to, to change the future of tourism. So I was in that space. So I brought in this person and, and I literally, she didn't know the area of mice. So I actually coached them, helped them to understand. Today, um, she will still say to me that, you know, you won't understand how you helped me to be where I am. She's a CEO now at the Cape Town International Convention Center. And, and, and I'm proud to say, you know, I've contributed to her journey in, in for her to have made it to where she is. Um, but I also look um, just at a variety of people that I've worked with um, who were reporting into me and not really um, focusing on I'm building you every day to become a something, but they've gone out to do amazing, amazing jobs. I've got, uh, you know, a very cool lady now. She's a marketing executive at NetBank. I've got people at uh, Stake in Echo that I've worked with. I've got people who have actually gone out of corporate to set up their own businesses and they're doing very, very well, far better than me. <laughs> and right. I love it. <laughs> you know, but I think it's actually quite nice to actually see that, you know, when I was in Limpopo, um, you know, I've got people who during COVID, you know, and I had left the organization who would call me and say, so please help me, my business, this and this and this. And I would just give them uh, advice and I said, let's do this and do this. And people come back and say, so you don't want you don't understand the help that you've given me is helped my business, it's grown my business and look at what my business is doing. I've taken those advices, um, you know, into that space. Um, recently, uh, there was a gentleman, um, he was in a, employed in a corporate uh, job and, and I've been mentoring him and I said to him, leave your job because you've got far bigger things to do. And he said, oh my gosh, what if nobody wants my talent? I said, I said look, you are going to be great. This weekend, I saw him in an event, he's doing amazing stuff. And I said, look, I told you, you will never go hungry because you're doing amazing things. And he's like, you know, thank you so much for the advice because I could be able to see for him that he was stuck in a, in a, in a corporate environment and he wasn't utilizing his talent. And I said, no, get out of it. Use your talent. You are going to be amazing. And now he's doing amazing, amazing stuff. Um, and he's taken on a huge new career on the social media content creation right. and he's doing a amazing. I mean, and, and I think sometimes, you know, when somebody says to you, stop a, a, a paid job, go to an unpaid job, you've got to really believe in them uh, in order to do that. Because the fear is always, what if I don't get the salary? What's going to happen? You know, and and he's gone and he's done amazing, amazing thing. So I've got a few, a few people. Um, and there is another girl that uh, has done very well. In fact, she's pushed a career in this whole uh, academic space, and mm -hmm. she's gone on to. She came to me. She was an intern, 
and I could see that this one had a spark. I wanted to work with her. So I grabbed her. I said, I'm going to work with her. I'm going to help you. So she, she has grown phenomenally in the mice space. And she's actually decided to take on the academic space. She told me now that she wants to go and do her PhD just because of the advices I gave her, you know, earlier on in her career. And every year she we always sit and we always talk about, you know, what what does she want to do going forward and how can it be done. So it's it's always rewarding, you know, when I meet these people that I've worked with, that I've I've mentored and see them do well. And and it also gives me comfort that, you know, I did something, I did something good. Thank you. And uh, Sonto, looking back over your leadership career, are there any role models of leadership that you encountered and maybe worked with that you would recommend future leaders should uh, learn from? <laughs> Look, um, there's a lot of people that uh, um, I have encountered um, that have also changed my outlook in terms of leadership um, as well. But what I do and what I always encourage a lot for people to do, I always encourage people to read a lot, to say, you know, don't take yourself out of the reading space and reading and reading other people's journeys and, and seeing how it compares to you and how you can infuse that into your life. So I do a lot of reading um, and I and I'm and I and I like that. Um, Recently, I was reading um, uh, Robert, Robin, Robin Sharma's um, uh, um, uh, Leading Without a Title, because also it was something I was battling with. So, you know, people want to see you when you have a title, yet I don't want the title to define who I am. I believe that I make an impact in society with or without a title. And I don't want the title to actually come into what I'm doing. And in fact, I always say to people, don't call me by the title, call me by my name, because my name is the one constant thing that will right. always be there. So, so that's that's quite in, important. Um, but I I also believe that um if we if we look at uh, um, the different sectors, um, there's a variety of people that um, you know you can you can uh, talk to. When I was in KZN, I worked with a gentleman called Mila Matola, mm -hmm. great leader. Um, in fact, he built me into the, to becoming the tourism expert that I am today, um, because he was also very selfless. You know, sometimes you work with managers who who don't want to give information it's almost like there's a fear of if you know more you're going to be better with them so he was very selfless he said I will train you what do you want to know and then he trained me when I first started in tourism and I always really really look up to to to, to that gentleman um I've got people um like um uh, now he is the minister of electricity I actually worked with him brilliant brilliant young mind um uh, Dr. Josienzo Ramachopa, brilliant brain, but also he just knew how to work with people and how to inspire people around him. Um, and you could go to him with any problem and he will find a solution and said, no, 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 this is how we must uh, have a look at it. So there's a, quite a lot of people that I've worked with. Um, when I was at Unilever, I worked with a guy called Case Kreithoff yeah. as a Dutchman. And, and what an amazing guy. I mean, he came into South Africa not knowing anything here and he was just having fun, but he was such an inspiring leader who pushed us to a level of, you can't say no, never use the word no. And when you shift your mind and you cancel the word no, you can then see what's possible. Because the yes actually comes with yes, this is how I can do it. The minute you say no, you block your thinking. So it's a variety of people that I've worked with. Um, and I continue to meet amazing people on a daily basis because in tourism, there's just a lot of people that we work with. Um, so yeah, it's a, I continue to draw strength from those people and draw inspiration from them. And, and they also continue to challenge me in what I do. 
you know, and, and how I lead, um, which I think is also very important for growth, for growth, definitely. Right. Now, Santo, how can our listeners reach out to you and where should they follow you? <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm very big on social media um these days. So I am on Twitter at uh, Sondo Ndlovu. I am on LinkedIn. If you go Noma Sondo Ndlovu, you'll find me. I am on Facebook, even though Facebook nowadays it's a little bit of a dated uh, for me. I'm on Instagram at Sondo Ndlovu as well. So definitely people can reach out to me. And, and Dr. Nick, what, what happens, I get a lot of people who reach out to me on these platforms. And what I've always committed to myself is when somebody reaches out to me and they want to learn something or they want a meeting, I want to give that to them because it has taken a lot from them to make that effort to say, I want to reach out to this person. I want to learn about one thing. So if you reach out to me on my DMs, Certainly, I'll respond and I will try and, and see what I can do, how I can assist if I can, uh, so that a person doesn't feel that, um, you know, they're just writing into a into a hole, you know, with, right. with, with people write into a hole and nothing happens. So that's my that's my commitment. If they come through, uh, I'm certainly uh, happy to have the conversation, whether it's a conversation about tourism whether it's a conversation about me or how I can help them, that I'm 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 very happy to be able to do. Thank you. And Santo, last but not least, what is your message to the millions of learners out there who are looking to finish school, starting a career, entering the world of work? What are maybe one or two success factors they should keep in mind? Uh, Dr. Nick, what's what's important for me is that wherever you are, always have the belief. You know, when I, when I got into Unilever, it wasn't because I was a marketing student. I was actually a psychology student, but Unilever saw a potential, brought me into the room and I went there and I showed up. So belief show up. Belief show up. So when somebody gives you an opportunity, just go for it. The, the one thing that we, we, we shouldn't have as young students sitting in a lecture hall is, is the fear, the fear of the unknown. Do not fear things you don't know. Do not fear people you don't know. You go out there, you understand what, what, what inspires you, what is your dream, no matter how small that dream is. You, 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 you work on it, you say, okay, I'm gonna go out there and I believe there's nothing that you're going to lose by following that dream and believing that you can do it. I mean, I walked into spaces at Unilever. In some instances, I was the only black person in the room because it was back in the day, it was in the 90s. But I walked in there with confidence and I walked in and I said, okay, I can do it. I'm now here. They gave me the opportunities. The opportunity, I'm not going to mess it up. I'm going to do it. And I always walked in with such confidence in fact, probably I was too confident <laughs> because, you know, sometimes when I look back at, at my career, I, sometimes I can't believe that I did that. But I was so determined that the minute you give me the opportunity, I'm grabbing it. So grab the opportunity and, and believe that you can do it. And of course, then you can. But most importantly, it's one thing that we've we've also made mistakes. I've also made that mistake sometimes of not utilizing your ecosystem and getting the support of the people around you, the network. So you already have a network of people, use them, ask for help because people are always willing to help you. So we mustn't be too embarrassed to ask for help. We mustn't right. be shy to ask for help because it's only through help that you can actually grow. So if you're sitting out there not knowing what to, to go for in terms of career-wise, reach out, ask somebody, but also believe when you get into a space, I can do it. I always say to myself, put me in front of anybody, leave me there, I will show up. So show up, you do your best because you have it within you to do it. And that's all I can say 
to the young people out there. And just for tourism students, one of the things that we battle with, Dr. Nick, in tourism, and, and one of the reasons I actually wanted to be in tourism is sometimes they only want to choose tourism as a last resort. Yeah. And I want to say to anybody out there that make tourism your first choice because tourism is a phenomenal space to be in. It is a catalyst for economic uh, uh, growth. It, it's, it hugely contributes to, to the GDP and it involves a whole lot of other sectors. I mean, we're sitting here, we work with engineers. When the engineers want to do a mega conference, that's a tourism, we wanna to work with them. We work with the medical doctors when we wanna do their mega Congress, that's tourism. We bring them here. Now we just had BRICS. BRICS, the conversation of BRICS is not a tourism conversation, but the conferencing of it is it touches tourism. So tourism is a catalyst. And I want the students to stop this thing of looking at choosing the tourism subjects as, as a last resort. It must be the first choice. We want them to come into the space. We want the smart ones to come here because we want innovation. We want ideas. We want to know what else can we do to grow tourism? How can we take tourism to greater heights? If we can grow the contribution of tourism into the GDP from right now it's about, I think we're sitting at about three, four percent because we've collapsed after the COVID to mm -hmm. back into 10 percent and more. We create jobs. When we create jobs, we put food on the table for many people and we change lives. So I'd like people to really think of tourism as an important career that they can join as a first uh, choice and, and come and make a difference. Thank you. Santo, thank you so much for sharing your insights and your, wisdom, you so and your wisdom into the future of leadership and for leading us by example. Thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, this opportunity. Thank you so much, Dr. Nick. Thank you.